Our next speaker is Matthew McBride. Matthew McBride is the Director of Publications for the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He's authored several publications, and I'll turn the time over to him. Thank you for speaking with us, Matthew McBride. Well, it is great to be here with you. Um, <clears throat> and not only are there a lot of mats on the, on the, on the program at, at FAIR this year, we have a lot of mats, many more mats to offer at the Church History Department. We, we joke about this frequently, that maybe we have kind of an affirmative action program for mats. Um, it's, um, it's, good, it's good to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a project that I've had the, the pleasure to be involved in over the past few years um, at the Church History Department. Um, and the Church History Department so, is, um, is, is housed, or, or, or most, most members of the Church History Department work here in this building that you see. It's the Church History Library. If you haven't had the opportunity to go to the Church History Library, I suggest you take that opportunity next time you're in Salt Lake City. It's uh, west of the Conference Center. Uh, and of course, it's, a, it's an archive and, and a library, and it has a reading room and, and all of the, the kinds of things you might expect of, of such an institution. But we also have um, some display cases that are available to you so that you can go see some of the treasures that are part of the church's collection. Um, and those collections are housed in this facility. You, you, if you look at it, you can see all the offices, of course, wrapped around the front. But if you look at the top, you can see the, uh, on the roof that, that kind of light colored bump there. That, that's, that's the vault that's in the back of the building. It's a, a, a large multi-story vault and it contains the, the church's historical collections. And since, um, well, since most of you will probably not ever have the opportunity to go into that vault and see what it looks like, I, I brought a picture of my team and, and me <laughs> in the vault just to give you a sense of what it looks like. It's actually much more boring than that. Uh, here's, here's an actual picture from the inside of that vault. Um, uh, and it just is full of rich historical treasures and documents. And, and it's a, uh, that's one of the pleasures that we, we have as, as members of the department is to be able to work with those collections to try to um, write and produce histories uh, both for uh, scholarly audiences, such as the Joe Smith Papers, uh, and for member audiences, such as, um, such as the Saints series of books, that, uh, we of which we released the first volume last year. Um, I want to talk just for a few minutes about Saints. You'll hear about this project from others, or, or have already heard about this project from others at the, at the conference. Uh, but my, my topic relates to it in a very direct way. Um, the Saints volumes are, uh, as you know, uh, our, most re our latest attempt as, as a church to produce a history, to fulfill the, the scriptural mandate to keep a history. And um, for those of you who have, re how many of you have read some of those those volumes. So, so a good number of you have read uh, parts of those. You know that um, that these volumes, which are the heart, the heart of the Saints Project, um, are written in a narrative style, uh, and and this was done with the intent of, of hopefully reaching a, a much broader audience than we might otherwise have reached if we had uh, taken a different uh, uh, approach to writing this history. Um, uh, they're very readable uh, and, and engaging and fun, fun to get into. Uh, but we also knew that um, as we published this history, in addition to making it very readable and, uh, and checking off another, a number of different boxes and, and objectives for this history, that, uh, that among those uh, was uh, an obligation to, to be as, as complete as we can to allow those who want a, a deeper dive uh, to learn more about history than what is in the narrative 
uh, that's presented in the books themselves, that we would give them recourse to more resources. And so, so I, what I hope to do is help you understand that the, the Saints Project not as just what's between the covers of those four books, uh, but that it has been a much larger effort that really spiders out to connect with a lot of the things that you see pictured here. Uh, including our uh, catalog, the efforts that have been, been made to digi I, obviously, apparently I'm talking too quietly, <laughs> to digitize the, the materials in our collection, make them uh, available to you, um, to publish the Joe Smith papers, to publish these other uh, materials. We have videos that we've produced in conjunction with Saints that tell some of the key stories and answer some of the questions that are raised in the, in the text of the books. We have a podcast. Um, we've published a series of uh, global histories, so short histories about uh, the church and, and the establishment of the church in eventually over 100 countries when the series is complete. Um, and a lot of these efforts, including the global histories and including the topics that I'll show you today, that I'll talk about with you today, and the, and the videos are, were produced as a part of the Saints Project and, and, and can be understood properly as part of, part of Saints. Um, so we, we deliver most of them, most of these resources via the Gospel Library app. <clears throat> And it would, be, it would not be inappropriate if you haven't looked at the church history section of the Gospel Library app for you to take your phone out uh, and, and pull up the Gospel Library app and go to the church history section just to take a quick look. I've got it here on the screen for those of you who want to just follow along up here. But you can see in the top left corner of Saints Volume 1 and then Volume 2. Um, right next to those, you'll see the church history topics that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about today. Uh, and a whole host of other resources. We've, you can see the global histories there. I hope you're all downloading all of these as I'm, as I'm listing them off. The Gospel Topics essays, uh, the first 50 years of Relief Society, and so forth. Um, these uh, topics are um, an effort that we've made to um, do some of the things that we really know are important to do, we know as historians we need to do in any, in any uh, history project that we're going to undertake, um, that we can't, because of the decisions we made about how to approach writing the narrative volumes, we couldn't do in the volumes themselves. And so in conjunction with um, the publication of each volume, a number of topics will be published to this resource and, and taken as a whole, they, at the end of the day, provide almost a nice um, alphabetical listening and encyclopedia of different historical topics um, that you can access in the app, as, um, as well as uh, the way that they're connected to saints, which I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, and each one of these topics um, addresses some issue or question or the life of a person or, or a place. Um, as I mentioned, they're connected to the footnotes of saints. So as you encounter uh, one of these issues or questions in the narrative, as the narrative raises a question, we, we've hopefully done a good job of, of providing in the footnotes a reference to one of the topics that can help answer that question. Um, many of the topics are uh, illustrated with photos. So if there's a character in the books that you really joy and enjoy uh, reading about and would like to know the rest of the story and see a photo, you know, connect with this person visually, you can, you can see their photos. Many of them have uh, videos that either tell stories in a, in a documentary uh, filmmaking style or address questions or, or attempt to provide answers to historical questions that you might have. Uh, and, and all of the topics contain additional readings and resources that you can use. Um, we, we recommend um, a, a lot of church resources that have been published. Uh, many, many of them might be things that we've published as a department and, and are some of the things that you saw there in the Gospel Library app. And, and others might be references to uh, scholarship uh, on this particular historical um, point. So, 
why publish all of these topics? Um, you know, did they, did they inter these are questions that people often have, do they introduce any new information? Um, for the most part, the topics are, you know, represent a brief synthesis of, of, a, of a vast historical literature that already exists. So in that sense, not, not doing any, any particularly new work. But there are instances uh, that I'll show you where they do introduce some original research. Um, but as we, as we developed our plans for saints and the church history topics, we identified several jobs that these topics needed to do. Um, and some of them relate, as I've said, specifically to the way that they dovetail and supplement the saint, uh, dovetail with and supplement the saints' books. Um, but as I looked at that list of jobs that we've we've always used as we've developed the topics <clears throat> in preparation for my presentation, it occurred to me that in some ways the, these, this list of jobs amounted to a kind of a statement of a of philosophy, a philosophy of public history. Uh, at least as it pertains to the church, writing the history of the church for members of the church. And so I wanted to talk about what some of these jobs are with you that we identified as we, as we scoped this project. Um, and then with each one articulate an underlying belief that explains why we felt it was important to write something along these lines. And then give you a few examples from, from the topics themselves. So, um, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the objectives of these topics is to is build on our efforts that we've uh, been making for really for, the, for, for some time now in the church history department to, to be more transparent about the history of the church. Um, and this, of course, is following in the example of the Joseph Smith Papers. Um, it's in extension this project is in, in many respects of the, the Gospel Topics Essays project that we were engaged in um, several years ago. Um, we have, uh, let's see, sorry, um, this, this is um, When, when, we, when we worked on the Gospel Topics essays, that we were uh, given this uh, somewhat limited charter to address some specific topics. And in the church history topics themselves, we've, we've taken uh, the opportunity to expand uh, on that list um, and to write on a, a, a much wider array of historical questions. Um, and these are, tend to be briefer than the, than the essays, but um, do do some similar work along these lines. Uh, and this, the examples of this might be topics that relate to plural marriage or other controversial aspects of church history. Um, one of the things that we, we, all, we try to do with the topics is to supply historical context. Um, we are mindful that the past is a foreign country, that they do things differently there. Um, and, and we remember that all of us are prone to view the past through a presentist lens. And presentism, of course, is the tendency to interpret the past in terms of modern cultural values. <clears throat> and historian Lynn Hunt said that presentism at its worst encourages moral complacency and self-congratulation. So interpreting the past in terms of present concerns usually leads us to find ourselves morally superior. And our forebears constantly fail to measure up to our present day standards. Uh, and, and one of the kind of the underlying belief that, that animates uh, our, our efforts here to, to provide context is that by, by giving context, um, that we're able, to, we're able to, to prevent this kind of thinking. Um, that's not to say that we cannot or should not reject aspects of past cultures as we encounter them and discover them, but we owe it to historical actors to attempt to understand their actions in terms of their time and place. So a couple of examples of this in the topics, um, and, and I'll reference topics, some of, some of which have been published and some of which are forthcoming with volume two, but uh, it, with volume two of Saints, we produced a topic that, uh, that deals with the question of Indian slavery and indentured servitude in Utah. Um, for many years before 
The pioneers arrived in the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. American Indians in the region had trafficked women and children that they captured from rival groups. Uh, white American and European traders also acquired and sold American Indian captives as slaves or indentured servants, uh, building a slave trade in the West. Uh, within weeks of entering the valley, the saints encountered Indian tribes who had captured children from other bands, and some saints bought Indian children from these slave traders. Uh, in some instances, after seeing the traders kill or torture those the Latter-day Saints did not purchase. In March of 1852, the legislature in Utah Territory passed an act for the relief of Indian slaves, um, a law that regulated the acquisition and care of Indian children. Uh, and these children could be indentured as household servants for up to 20 years under this law. Uh, but those who acquired servants were required to process an indenture agreement with county officials to clothe the children in, comfortable, in a comfortable and becoming manner and to provide them with education. Now this is a, this is a challenging and, and a difficult thing for us to think about. Um, and one of the questions a lot of times that comes up when you encounter this is why did they not just adopt the children? Uh, why, why make them indentured servants? And, and in an effort to provide a little bit of context that helps, helps us understand the situation um, that the Latter-day Saints were in in that moment, we, we, we've written this. Um, adoption was a relatively new type of family relationship in 19th century America. So the first adoption statute was passed in Massachusetts in 1851. And until 1884, there was no legal provision for adopting children in Utah Territory. Prior to these laws, indenture and apprenticeship were common ways for children of working class, poor, or disrupted families to gain the benefits of living in a middle class home, uh, including education and vocational training. And many scholars view adoption laws as an outgrowth of the practice of indenture. So we, we felt like this uh, historical context is helpful uh, to a reader in understanding this um, is somewhat troubling fact that they encounter as they study church history. Um, another example would be, um, would relate to Martin Harris. Uh, he comes under attack frequently for some of the ways that he chose to describe his encounter with the, the Book of Mormon plates, um, referring to that experience as having seen the plates through spiritual eyes in some instances. Um, and and we've, we've, we've attempted to help uh, help understand Martin Harris's point of view and his use of that language in this way. Uh, many Christians in Harris's day believed that it was dangerous or impossible to witness the divine with the physical senses. This belief was rooted in stories from the Bible. For example, in the Old Testament, Israelites who appeared in the Ark of the Covenant without proper authorization were destroyed. God's presence was typically hidden behind a veil or a cloud of smoke to shield the eyes of those who were not spiritually prepared. And one of Joseph Smith's early revelations affirmed similarly that humans cannot see God with their natural eyes without being consumed. They could, however, witness his glory with spiritual eyes if they were changed or quickened by the Spirit of God. And it's clear that Martin Harris considered the witness, his witness experience with the plates as just such as just such an encounter with the divine. Uh, and conscious of the stern warnings of scripture, he often spoke of the inadequacy that he felt at the time he witnessed the plates. Uh, over the years, he employed a variety of phrases to describe his extraordinary encounter. And when pressed by various interviewers to clarify whether he actually saw the plates or spoke, he, he spoke both of seeing them with a spiritual eye emphasizing the unusual and sacred quality of the experience, and also with his physical senses. As sure as you are standing there and see me, he insisted on one occasion. Just as, um, just as sure did I see the angel with the golden plates in his hand. And then we note that David Whitmer similarly described both the spiritual and physical dimensions of the witness's experience. Uh, when he said, of course, we were in the spirit when we had the view. For no man can behold the face of an angel except in a spiritual view, he explained, adding, but we were in the body also, and everything was as natural uh, to us as it is at any time. So those are some examples of how um, 
how context can, um, can help us avoid presentism and make better sense of some of the unusual things that we, that we encounter. So the next one, um, we, we call this Tell the Rest of the Story, and the origin, the origin of that is just the fact that, um, as those of you who read Saints know, um, we, we have point of view characters, and we come and we're with those point of view characters for a short period of time, and then we move on to other point of view characters who witnessed other events. Uh, and, and frequently, as we tested um, the volumes we had uh, with readers, we had people asking, um, asking questions about what, whatever happened to these, <laughs> to these people. So they, they fell in love with Amanda Barnes Smith, for example, uh, when we told her story about Hans Mill and wanted to know the rest of the story. And so, so many of the topics are an attempt to fulfill this need. Um, but but the, the statement of kind of belief or philosophy behind this is that to learning to see the world through another person's eyes and to understand their choices uh, as they understood them in the moment promotes charity, promotes patience, it allows others the dignity that they deserve as God's children. Uh, and a couple of examples that I thought of along these lines include um, our topic, our forthcoming topic on Brigham Young. So sometimes Brigham Young's reputation suffers due to his record on race or the violent incidents that um, occurred uh, during his administration. But in assessing Brigham Young, uh, these issues alone provide a skewed portrait. They need to be considered along with many other factors, uh, including the clarity of his prophetic vision around the building of a Zion society in which the poor are cared for and the tenacity and creativity with which he pursued this vision, uh, the tenderness with which he treated his family, uh, his honesty about his own weaknesses and his persistence in trying to overcome them. Uh, Brigham Young was a complex figure by any measure. Uh, another example would be our topic on Fanny Alger Custer. Uh, Fanny's often objectified in a sense. She's used as a stick. Uh, that defenders and critics of Joseph Smith alike use in their debates to kind of beat each other up. And it's one thing to try to make sense of the sources about her marriage to Joseph Smith in Kirtland. Uh, it's a different thing to sit down, we found, and to write a biographical sketch of Fanny. Uh, we wanted to show her uh, as, as a complete person, to allow her to have a complex personhood. She had a life after her time in Kirtland that was full, uh, and it deserves to be part of the story that we tell about her. Um, and I just wanted to give you a quick glimpse of some of the things that we learned as we studied um, Fanny's life, uh, things that uh, many of you may not have known. Um, some of this was, was new, uh, re original research that arose out of our, our effort to, to write these topics. She was born in 1816 to Samuel and Clarissa Alger. She joined the church with her family in the early 1830s and worked in Joseph Smith's household in Kirtland, Ohio. Um, of course, several Latter-day Saints who lived in Kirtland in the 1830s later reported that Fanny Alger married Joseph Smith, becoming his first plural wife. But the marriage was evidently of short duration. She, uh, she left Ohio with her parents in 1836 for Missouri, apparently staying at a tavern uh, along the National Road, the mo one of the most widely traveled roads in the country. Uh, and this tavern was owned by the family of Solomon Custer, and it was in Dublin, Ohio. Excuse me, Dublin, Indiana. Um, within a few months, Fanny married Solomon. Uh, and she remained in Dublin for the rest of her life uh, when her parents uh, continued on to, to far west Missouri and, and later uh, Nauvoo, and then finally Utah and St. George. Um, Fanny's, yes, so Fanny's family followed the main body of the saints from Missouri to Illinois and ultimately to southern Utah. And when Fanny's father, a patriarch, passed away in the 1870s, his obituary celebrated his family's faithfulness. Fanny and Solomon uh, Custer had nine children, only two of whom survived Fanny. The Custers maintained a grocery store uh, in Dublin, Indiana. They invested in a sawmill in nearby Louisville. 
The family moved to Louisville briefly during a time of financial difficulty, and Solomon attempted to sell the sawmill but ultimately declared bankruptcy. Uh, Fanny and Solomon then moved back to Dublin, where they remained until Solomon's death in 1885. Uh, the two of them attended the local Universalist church that Solomon's father had helped establish. And during Fanny's later years, uh, she became interested in spiritualism. Uh, and uh, a lot of people across a, a wide spectrum of Christian denominations were, became interested in, in this phenomenon or, or this movement of spiritualism that of, of, in its most recognizable form involved um, spirit mediums that, would, um, that claim to receive communications from, from uh, departed spirits. <clears throat> so after Solomon's death, uh, well, actually, before, before I leave that, I mean, I just realized I haven't advanced my slide. So this is a this is a little newspaper article that was published at about the the time of her her death, and it alerts us to the fact that Fanny herself was not only uh, interested in spiritualism but was a spirit medium, and that she received communications. Um, several of which were on record, and we were able to even find one of these communications, which was a, uh, was a, a revision of a Calvinist hymn that made it feel a lot more universalist. Um, so after Solomon's death, Fanny moved to Indianapolis to live with her son Lafayette, and then she died in 1889. and was buried in Dublin next to Solomon in a plot of ground that he had cleared as a child. So uh, this, is, this is Fanny Alger Custer. Um, she lived a long life, and, and it was a, it was a, she's a complex person. She, she, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to, to another place, another time, for somebody to address the interesting questions that, that, are, that, this, that this history raises about Fanny's relationship to the, to the church uh, and her interest in um, the Latter-day Saint movement as a young woman. Um, but, but we felt like it was important uh, to provide and, and do our best to, to, to provide a record that, that tells this complete story instead of focusing so incessantly on, on one uh, moment, one controversial moment. Um, so the next one would be we want to show change over time, and we have a lot of topics that do this. You'll see um, some of these, or many of them, tend to be topics about different um, organizations within the church, whether it's the Relief Society or it's um, the Young Women's Organizations or, or others, uh, where we, we kind of are able to trace a, a long institutional history and show how the church's institutions and policies have evolved over time. But the thing that animates us here is that we, we believe that understanding how revelation comes line upon line is important, and it helps us in, to sustain church leaders with patience, and it brings enduring principles into relief. Um, you know, revelation almost always comes in response to questions that are brought forward by the, the cultural milieu in which the prophets lived. And this revelatory dynamism is one of the striking features of the restored church. And if we really believe that God's hand has helped direct the history of the church through revelation, then in one sense we can read the church's vast historical record as one way that God communicates his will. Uh, and exa examining changes in church history helps us put in enduring principles in relief against a backdrop of, of almost constant flux. Um, in terms of, of organizational change. Um, one example of this might, might be just the way we're able in the topics to trace um, um, so there, there's a series of topics, one on, on consecration and stewardship, one on tithing, one on cooperatives, one on united orders, and one on the, the church security plan. Um, and and we'll, we'll continue to carry that forward in later volumes, but um, one of the things that we can see here is, is an attempt, um, at various attempts by the Latter-day Saints to implement principles that remain constant, that, are, that endure, 
but take, uh, take on different institutional incarnations over time. Um, another example of this would be our topic on the restoration of the Melchizedek Priesthood. Um, we, we do have one narrative of that uh, event, if, if, if we want to call it an event, that says that Peter, James, and John came and the Melchizedek Priesthood was restored. Uh, what the topic does for us is show, um, show that restoration of priesthood as, as a process that took years, even decades, and, and maybe even longer. Um, some of the things that, that, that it notes um, include the fact that early on, um, <clears throat> Joseph Smith and, and Oliver Cowdery understood this restoration in, uh, not in terms of Melchizedek priesthood, uh, but in terms of what the Baptist told them when he uh, appeared to, to restore authority to baptize, which is that they now had the power to baptize, but that the power of laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost should be conferred hereafter. And so this becomes, this comes to be understood as a greater authority, uh, uh, so there's a lesser and a greater authority rather than uh, Melchizedek priesthood. And during the first few years that the church was organized, um, they didn't use the term Zoranic priesthood or Melchizedek priesthood to describe the authority they received. Uh, their understanding of priesthood developed over time and with the aid of continued revelation. Uh, I won't take too much more time on this. The, the offices were in constant flux as well. There were more keys, more ordinances that were revealed as time went by. And near the end of his life, Joseph Smith spoke with exultation um, of the Lord's blessings in restoring the fullness of the priesthood. And he described this restoration not as a single event, but rather a series of episodes spanning his ministry. He noted that the priesthood had been restored line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. He recounted the miraculous appearance of diverse angels, each restoring their dispensation, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood. So there are other, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through very many more. I've got one more I'd like to conclude with. Some of the other things that we do with the topics are, are to clarify or update well-known stories uh, based on more recent research, to interrogate sources more closely, uh, in particular the sources that we, we use in Saints. We try to be as, as careful as we can to help readers understand the strengths and weaknesses of the sources that we use in Saints, which, but that's not something we can do in the narrative of the books. We, we, we do that in the topics. And then we, we try to encourage further reading by pointing you to additional resources. Um, this, this, last, um, this last one I wanted to just touch on briefly. We actually, I mentioned those. Okay, is, is we, we want to provoke um, pondering because we believe that we don't have to treat historical issues or difficult questions like sideshows that we need to hurry past uh, to get on with other matters. Um, we do this frequently uh, when we teach. But sometimes looking at these difficult and challenging events um, in, a, in, in a just a just more squarely has, has some benefits and can teach us. And I wanted to show like a very, very brief video clip. It's just about two minutes long. Um, that's a, of a video that will be embedded in the topic on the Mountain Meadows Massacre uh, to help you see why we think this is possible and how we might do it. This isn't a subject that we often talk about in Sunday school. Uh, and yet this video, I think, does a successful job of juxtaposing the handcart rescue of 1856 and the Mountain Meadows Massacre in 1857. And, and in so doing, oops, excuse me, in so doing, um, brings to the surface some important lessons that we can learn. I'll just show you the end of this clip. So what do we do with circumstances that are like this? I think the best and really the only way that we can deal with circumstances like this is to look at them in their entirety mm -hmm. and look at them honestly and then see what we can learn from them, both individually and as a community. And what lesson do you think we should learn from this? On the individual level, I think how we react to others, how we consider them in our minds is extremely important. If we choose to act in a Christ-like manner, 
and reach out to people, even in a spirit of self-sacrifice, mm -hmm. that creates an upward spiral that eventually takes us mm -hmm. to where we are not only benefiting others, but we ourselves are being strengthened in the process. If we go the opposite direction and spiral downward by beginning to treat people with suspicion, beginning to treat them as though they are the other, then that suspicion eventually leads to a confirmation of suspicion. It becomes a, a self-reinforcing prophecy. And then once you begin to see another person as an enemy, you begin to treat them as an enemy, and the result ultimately is that you end up in conflict. In the case of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, in a horrible conflict that led to complete destruction of people who never should have been hurt. So what should we learn about this as a group, as Latter-day Saints in general? Well, one thing I think we can learn is the importance of councils. When it came to rescuing the handcart pioneers, people got together, they counseled together on the best way to send supplies and people out there to help them. In the case of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, each time a council met and considered the details and included the collective wisdom of the group, the decision that was made was generally good. When people then left those councils and tried to operate independently or in small groups that didn't like the consensus of the council, then the circumstances tended to get worse. So we can celebrate their handcart rescue and learn valuable lessons from it, but we should also remember the Mountain Meadows Massacre so we learn important lessons from that as well. Exactly. The massacre has things to teach us about the past, and I also think that just as we grieve for Latter-day Saints of the past who were killed through persecution, I think we likewise need to grieve for those who died senselessly in the Mount Meadows Massacre. We need to remember them. We need to honor them. Okay, so this is an example again of not making a sideshow and dismissing too quickly uh, something that we're uncomfortable with, but taking a moment to address it squarely and think about the implications of that event or series of events for our faith, for our understanding of, uh, of, of who we are and, and where we are. Um, so just, just in, in conclusion, um, there are 115 topics that were published with Volume 1. There will be 68 more published with Volume 2 and, and, and others that will um, be released in conjunction with the third and fourth volumes. And you can see here on the screen a sampling of, of some of what's available, um, but there are many more. Um, and, and we just hope that this is a helpful resource to you as you read saints and do your own, uh, go through your own process of, of discovery about church history. Uh, and also as you talk to others who in, encounter questions or struggle, um, that this will be a resource that you, that you have recourse to. So thank you. So here's a good one. Um, do, do church leaders control what you bring into transparency, as Leonard Aaron, Arrington alluded to? Um, it, absolutely, in a sense. Um, we're, we're publishing for the church, and all the work that we do is, is correlated. Um, what I would say, though, in response to that question is, is that I've been just unceasingly um, impressed and, and in some ways pleasantly surprised as somebody who um, has, has come to the department in recent years at the, the willingness of church leaders to, to allow us to address various topics. Um, I, think, I think in some respects the record of what we've been able to publish does, speaks for itself in, in that regard. Um, we we have we have a lot of support in this work. Um, Elder Snow, who is is becoming emeritus this month, has been a, a phenomenal support and an advocate. Um, and just as we we've been able to do with the Joe Smith papers, with the gospel topics essays and, and church topics and church history topics and other other efforts, um, there's there's widespread support and a, and a 
uh, an understanding of the topics of willingness uh, to, to have us move ahead and, and, and be transparent on, on almost every topic that we've approached them on. Um, are there any topics you have not been given permission to work on? Um, let's see how much. Are there any? I you know. I don't. I can't. I can't think of. I can't think of any that we've that we have said we need to talk about this and gone and asked and been told no way. Um, how much of the archives have been read, looked at since the church has become more transparent? Uh, looked at and read by, by whom? Um, you know, the collection is enormous. Uh, and there are, there, are, there are archivists who have very good understanding of uh, an intellectual control over portions of it. Um, but, but, you know, working within their, within their field of, of specialty. Um, I, I, would, I wouldn't know how to, how to answer that in a, in a quantitative way. Um, but we have very extensive access to the materials in the work that we do, and the church is doing a lot to open up those archives. So this, and if, if someone from, from our, preserv our digital preservation team were here, they could speak to this in, in more specifics, but we're, we're digitizing. I want to say millions of images on, you know, on, <laughs> I, I think every year, um, and that that collection is becoming more and more accessible to you um, as as time goes by. Let's see. Um, let me see. What's that? So, I mean, I have one here that will will maybe let me answer a, a broader question. There's a, the question about how about whether the essay on the Book of Abraham in church history topics disagrees with the gospel topics essay. What I would say is that in each instance when we um, publish it a church history topic on one of those topics that's uh, already been addressed in the gospel topics essay. We simply excerpt a short portion of the gospel topics essay and then refer to that essay. So, so there, should be, there should be no disagreement. Um, I, I think that's about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you.